Hi, I'm Dr. Doris Mensa Agri, and I work at the Institute for Pastoral Initiatives at the University of Dayton. And welcome to the Southeast Catechist Conference, which is organized by the Archdiocese of Atlanta. So my presentation for today is Moses the Water Baby, stories from the Old Testament. And yes, I'm sure that there may be a lot of brows raised. Moses the Water Baby, but sometimes we have to create topics that would be fascinating to people. So Moses, the water baby, here we go. As catechists, uh, we, we strive to be formed in order to form others. So this presentation really is about providing you with some understanding of the Old Testament and how you can assist families your own and those with whom you interact to use stories, characters, figures, and events in the Old Testament for catechesis. Are you ready? Let's go. The title of my presentation is Scripture and Catechesis, How Parents Can Bring the Word to Life in Their Families. So, um, there are three points that I'd like to bring to your attention before I even tackle the agenda, agenda rather. By delving into the stories, um, let's make sure that we are on the same page. And usually I take three points, I think the Trinity and three. The first is the fact that the sacred scriptures have always had a central and formative place in catechesis. The second is the Bible is a living word. Um, it's actually the living word of God that invites us to conversion um, through personal encounter with Christ. I've often said that when somebody says they encountered Christ and they remained um, not transformed, then they encountered somebody and not Christ, because when you encounter Christ, there is some level of transformation in your life. And the third is as catechists, our lives mirror what we believe, not so much what we say. So people look at the way we live our lives and that is the gospel they read. And so um, the other thing is, with the Old Testament, because I'm dwelling on the Old Testament, the Old Testament is unveiled in the New Testament, and the New Testament fulfills um, the Old Testament or is fulfilled in the Old Testament. Um, if you recall, during the gospel, Jesus mentioned several times, I have come to fulfill the law and the prophets. Right now, the time is too short to discuss biblical typology, but you can look that up. So you find types such as Moses um, um, being Christ or typified, and then Abraham's attempt to sacrifice Isaac uh, is prefigured in the crucifixion. So this is what typology is, is about. Also think of the unity of sacred scripture as the New Testament is hidden in the Old Testament and the Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament. So with these three points, let's move on to helping families better understand and utilize stories from the Old Testament um, for formation, bearing in mind that Christ is always, always the central focus of all that we do. So we would look at what constitutes the Old Testament. Of course, we know there are 46 books, and I'll come to the breakdown of the books later. And then we have some main themes of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch or the Torah or the law as um, it's often referred to. And then we have the historical books and the writings. Um, we'd also look at, um, and I mentioned the prophets also, we have the major prophets and the minor prophets. And then we'll look at how to incorporate Old, Old Testament stories into family catechesis. And that's where I came up with the title, was Moses a water baby or Moses a water baby? We'll get to that. Then we always have to be mindful to place whatever story or event 
or character figures within context and how to apply them to our lives, to daily lives, to things around us, to events around us. So for instance, the story of Moses, the water baby, you can apply that to immigration and what is going on within our country now. And then I, of course, I will summarize um, what we've gone through today. So we will talk about revelation and the canon of scripture. Um, as I said earlier on, scripture really is a living word of God. And just here, it's, this is a quotation that you find in the catechesis and also uh, the Catechism for the Catholic Church and the Verbum Article 24, uh, where it says, um, the church constantly finds her nourishment and her strength, for she welcomes it not as a human word, but as what it really is, the word of God. And you can actually link this even to the Eucharist, because when we go to mass, the Eucharist, we are nourished. So this is another way of linking the new and the old. And again, throughout the Old Testament, you know, the story of the Israelites, how the Israelites were formed, the Exodus, um, the laws and all that, God reveals himself to us through the patriarchs, the prophets, the historical events, and all these culminated in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Now, um, um, with, uh, we also have to be mindful of the fact that when we talk about history, um, there is a marked difference between the ancient world and the modern world. Um, in the ancient world, history really was, you know, just past remembrances, you know, the past is remembered, but it is not chronological. In the modern world, it is a definite location with, uh, you know, referring to the time of the event. So the two are, are not the same. And then we have to look at, so how do we then choose the stories or the events or the figures um, for catechesis? Um, they must be age related and there must be aspects of the story that would be easy to understand. So for instance, you can't you can just pick um, some of the wisdom literature. Um, for instance, um, Proverbs 9, 10, where it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and share that with a four-year-old. It really wouldn't make much sense. It would make sense to a teenager um, even though they may not at that time be willing to listen, but it would make sense to them. So some of these stories would definitely, in fact, all would be, would have to be age um, related. Another one would be, you know, thinking of the, um, the Jacob, Jacob's Ladder, which you find in Genesis 28. If you tell that story to a child of about four or five who's having difficulty sleeping, you know, and you think, oh, Jacob picked up the stone and slept on it and dreamt about a ladder going into the heavens. And then God told him, I am with you always. You know, so when you relate such a story to a child who is afraid of going to bed alone, that assurance of God being with him or her always um, would help. So I come back to the constitution of the Old Testament. Um, there are, as I said, um, 46 books in the Old Testament. Um, we talk about the Pentateuch or the Torah or the law. And then we have the historical books. You know, you think you read about 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings. We have the wisdom literature, the Proverbs, the Psalms. And then we have the prophetic books, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Amos, Micah, Habakkuk, uh, all these combined to form um, the Old Testament. One thing also that I like to draw your attention to is how the canon came about. We, for us Catholics, they were inspired and they are inerrant, meaning there is no error in what um, the writers wrote down. I just put a few things here on the right side of the screen, um, where St. Jerome 
um, when he translated um, the Bible from the Septuagint to um, the Vulgate, it said ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ. Um, again, you find this in the Verbum Article 25. And then in, in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, we are reminded that all scripture is inspired by God and it is to teach the truth, all scripture, not some scripture. Also, I just would like to point out that when we talk about the canon, really it's, it's a Hebrew for, you know, a read, a stick for measurement. So for us Catholics, um, there's a way by which we came about our canon, which is very different from all other denominations. Um, you can, you know, go through the gamut of all the Protestant um, um, churches and how they came um, about their canon. For us Catholics, we have 46, and because uh, 46 books in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament, and we have 46 because of the deuterocanonical books, which are called the Second Canon, um, because some books were added to the Greek um, canon, and um, some of the books, um, these the Greek canon um, came about. Um, let me put it this way, they were added to the Greek translation from the Septuagint and included in the Vulgate, the Latin translation. And these are Sirach, um, Wisdom, Baruch, First and Second Maccabees, Tobit, Judith, and some parts of Esther and um, Daniel. And so again, you would, if you're not sure when you're getting the Bible, just look if they have these books in them, then you can determine um, whether it's a Catholic Bible or not. And so um, if I, I think I just went over, I'll, I'll repeat um, the Pentateuch, you have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. And these basically provide the laws um, for, initially was for the Jews, right? The Hebrews, that's why we call them the Hebrew scriptures. And then when you look at the historical books, um, there are 11 plus the deuterocanonical books that I just mentioned. And they talk about the stories of the Israelites, their journeys, the kings. Now you remember how the first king, Saul, um, came about because the Israelites wanted a king. And then we come to the prophetic books, um, which are 18. Um, we have the major prophets and the minor prophets. And some of the major prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and then we have some of the minor prophets um, like Amos, Zechariah, and Habakkuk. So again, how do we use these um, to assist parents to form their families? Um, I would go back to the fact that there are aspects um, of the stories or the characters or the figures that must appeal to specific age groups. You would have to pick stories um, that are attractive, that are fascinating, and that will pique the interest of those with whom you interact. So even if you're sharing some of these stories with whether it's children or adults, you would have to pick ones that would really grasp the attention and then, um, you know, after you've selected these, one of the ways, uh, at least in my culture, we do a lot of st storytelling and I bet in a whole lot of cultures. So you can bring in aspects of storytelling. And then the key really when you're dealing, especially with children, is don't always provide them with the morale of the story. Have the children themselves come up with the morale of the story after you are done. That way it would stick a lot, lot better. So here, we try to incorporate Old Testament stories into family catechesis. First, we remember that scripture is the living word of God. I believe I've said that. Again, we remember that it is God who has revealed himself to us throughout the Old Testament, not just one book, but from um, Genesis um, to Zechariah through all that God has revealed himself to us. So we'll just pick a story. And for today, I picked Moses, the water baby. I'll get to that later. And I have this quotation here. 
um, that all scripture is but one book. And this one book is Christ because all divine scripture speaks of Christ. So as I said earlier on, Christ was prefigured in the Old Testament. And then in the New Testament, he fulfills the Old Testament. So the two work together. You cannot really separate the two, but I'm just dwelling on the Old Testament and Sister Angela and Zukowski would dwell on the New Testament. Um, both of us are from the Institute for Pastoral Initiatives. So was Moses a water baby? Let's find out. I, I chose a story which you find in Exodus 2. Um, and actually it began in Exodus chapter one towards the end, and then Exodus chapter two just goes through the whole story. So I, I thought this would be really, um, it would be easy to adapt um, to children and it would grasp their attention. There are some fascinating facts about the story. And so you can actually retell the story in your own way, or you can designate some of the children to play these different characters. So first of all, Moses' mother and sister creates this beautiful basket um, in which they place Moses and then put him in the Nile River because this Pharaoh, um, who this new Pharaoh and that the Egyptians got, did not know Joseph and was being mean to the Hebrews and had actually mandated that all Hebrew children be killed. And he had even um, asked all the Hebrew midwives to kill the boys who were born, but the midwives couldn't do so because they feared God and God protected them. So he mandated that all Hebrew little boys should be killed. And so Moses' mother was trying to protect her son, Moses. Now we are told that when Pharaoh's daughter went to bathe in the Nile, he saw um, this um, baby and he had pity on him, compassion. Right. So, in fact, the first one I talk about the basket. So Moses's mother was wise. You no, know, she trusted and she was courageous. And when we look at Pharaoh, Pharaoh's daughter, um, she had compassion. So, again, you know, I see this as God's favor, as love. I, I you know, when I tell the story, I, I say Moses's daughter, uh, sorry, Pharaoh's daughter fell in love with the baby Moses. And the, the children go, ah, oh, ah. so already there, you, you are grasping the attention of the children, right? Now get this. So Pharaoh's daughter um, asked for a nurse to take care of the baby. Now it was, it was Moses' sister who was standing by in, and then suggested, oh, can I get a nurse for you? And Pharaoh's daughter says, yes. And so Moses's real mother is now here taking care of Moses and being paid for it. C can you believe that? Now, when I had my two children, nobody paid me for taking care of them. I don't think you did, you know, you were in the same shoes anyway. But here, I call it twice favored. So the real mother of Moses is taking care of him and she's being paid to do so. Can you imagine that? Now, so Pharaoh's daughter names him names him Moses and her reason is because I drew him out of the water and that is why I say Moses is a water baby right and so that's we we realize that the role water plays a role in our history we talk about baptism Jesus was baptized in the Jordan we are baptized to be members of the Christian family so you can use the story in so many ways. And then you can even have the children retell the story and add their own and then have them relate the story to something that is going on around in their community, whether at home or a movie they've watched, a story they've heard at school, or even link it to some family members and then make the biblical stories real um, for them. Now, I just wanted to quote this from the directory for catechesis, where it says the family is a proclamation of faith in that it is the natural place in which faith can be lived in a simple and spontaneous manner. It is indeed a Christian education more witnessed to than taught, more occasional than systematic, 
more ongoing and daily than structured into periods. And I believe that strongly because as, as family members, when we will live what we believe, our children pick up. Yes, when they are young adults, they may go other ways, but the seed has been sown and you can be sure that they would often return to that seed. So this, I, I, I thought this paragraph stands out for what we are trying to do in family catechesis. So even the story of Moses being the water baby, you can relate the story to your family members and have them relate to uh, relate the story to other incidents in your life or you know within the community around you. So let's summarize. We began with saying that scripture is a living word of God. It centers around Christ from the Old Testament through the New Testament. And then, you know, the three main points, the law or the Pentateuch or the Torah. And then we have the prophets and the historical writings. And then you would choose stories that would speak to specific um, age groups and make sure to apply them. Now, when you're applying these stories, you can also think of the cultural context, how diversity comes in. Within my culture context, you know, we would often link it to um, someone whose life is worthy to be emulated. Um, you can find such incidents in your own culture. And so hopefully um, this has been helpful and um, I would encourage you um, to look at the, some of the references that I've provided, and also you can participate in some of the courses we offer here at the Institute. Thank you and have a wonderful day. God bless you.